Hey everyone, thanks very much, Lee Lee, for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, I work at the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland. Uh, although I am originally from Estonia, like Lily is. Sorry if I revealed anything. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm a health data scientist. Uh, I spend most of my days writing R code, sometimes a little bit of SQL to help with R. Um, and obviously everything that comes with kind of a researchy uh, job. In this talk, I'm going to just give you uh, a few highlights of the few, uh, what I think are the coolest ways to use R for health data science. Uh, but uh, some of the tips and tricks are completely applicable to uh, really any kind of R uh, users. Uh, in general, it's not uh, specific to medicine. Uh, I'm a physicist by background, I'm not a medical doctor, so um, I wouldn't be comfortable speaking about medical uh, results anyway. Um, okay, uh, just as a general introduction, um, the reason people use R is, is it does amazing visualizations, all the statistics, all the machine learning, uh, and most people, I think, have heard, heard of Shiny apps as well, where you can make interactive websites using R alone. But I think what needs to be pointed out, and uh, when what people often forget, is the the amazing community that actually comes with R. Um, and there are probably now millions of people around the world using R, uh, and a lot of them are very active online, helping each other, posting questions, posting answers. Um, obviously, you're aware of the R Ladies group because you will be here otherwise. Uh, but if you have any non-lady R friends, you can refer them to the R for Data Science Learning Community. Um, uh, if you're on Twitter, then hashtag rstats is where I get most of my cool new information about new functions and how to do things in R. And the um, R Studio community, uh, I would say, is a modern alternative to Stack Overflow. So Stack Overflow is obviously great, and I spend a lot of time there copy-pasting solutions. Um, uh, but because it's been around for so long, uh, often the top responses are the ones who uh, have had most views. So they're maybe from 10 years ago, uh, whereas really the new, uh, newer functions from newer packages are often at the very bottom of the page or maybe no one's even bothered. Whereas if you go to our studio community, it has a similar interface to Stack Overflow, but you'll actually get the more modern, the, the kind of tidy versy um, things if you, um, if you, uh, are looking into tidyverse functions. And finally, Bookdown as a package for writing books in R has, um, I think it's opened up like a revolution of free R books. So these are all books that are published uh, with kind of proper publishers, uh, mostly O'Reilly and Chapman and Hall, um, uh, who is publishing R books, but all of these books are fully freely available uh, on bookdown.org because uh, that's kind of the, uh, the trend and <laughs> it's a good trend um, uh, to make your uh, books available. Um, you don't need to use Bookdown to write books. We also have an internal cookbook uh, where our team members kind of copy paste little snippets of code, you know, this is how I make this type of crap, this is how I loaded that data set that other people might be using. So Bookdown is a really good way to uh, store our code in, um, in kind of little online books. Uh, so this is a shout out to Bookdown. So on the topic of Shiny apps, this is uh, this is a pretty standard st Shiny app. This is one I've made. It has the basic uh, kind of layout of the uh, select some variables on the left and then a plot and a table appears on the right. Uh, this is publicly available at SSI at globalsearch.org. So the, obviously the cool thing about Shiny apps is that you non-NAR users can quickly interact with your data set without having access to it. So it's both secure and kind of fast and efficient. So this is patient data, um, but you can check any variables against any variables without actually see, ever seeing a single kind of line of patient being pointed out. And um, uh, like I said, the design is pretty basic here, um, just because I make a lot of shiny apps and I don't have time to design them. However, you should not 
ever limit yourself. If you're into design and you want to make something that's quite user facing, uh, you know, gets used by more than just a couple of research teams, then you should check out the shiny contest for inspiration uh, because it turns out the shiny apps don't have to look like this. Shiny apps, for example, I can show you the, um, uh, this is uh, last year's winner, uh, or this year, sorry, this is winner uh, of the uh, shiny competition. I've just grabbed it from the uh, winners page. And look, this is a shiny app. So those who have made shiny apps or have seen shiny apps, always looking the way my shiny app looked there. This is also a shiny app. You can also do this. So you don't have to restrict yourself to uh, the quite, uh, quite a basic, or the basic uh, layout is useful. Um, and it, uh, people can understand it really well. So, so shiny apps uh, are much wider than some people might think. Now, um, and most people uh, maybe have heard of shiny apps and agree that they're good for exploring data sets without giving users access to the underlying data set. Uh, they're um, useful for getting plots and tables if you're not an R user yourself, because you can use the Shiny app. Um, they're very good for teaching. I use it to um, kind of teach statistical concepts. However, you can also use Shiny apps to run clinical trials. And this is what I'm going to show you next, the two examples of how, where, how we use Shiny apps in clinical trials. So first of all, this is where I work, the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, um, where the university and the hospital are kind of, uh, kind of intertwined. Some of those buildings are university buildings, some are hospital. The hospital building itself has university offices within it, so it's all one big family. But this is the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. And from the same app I showed you previously, um, we did a study uh, kind of assessing the, uh, how many patients develop a wound infection of the ab abdominal surgery. And in, uh, so the high, middle and low here are at different countries, uh, kind of income level. So we um, researched uh, across the world. And even in high income countries, 10% of patients develop a wound infection of the surgery, um, which is, it just kind of happens. It's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, you can't, fully forever kind of avoid complications. But what you can do is try to detect that an infection is starting as soon as possible, because the earlier you detect a starting in the, in, uh, infection, the sooner you can treat it, and then hopefully it doesn't get so bad. So we're doing uh, a clinical trial where we're trying to uh, detect uh, wound infections earlier is by getting patients to send us photos of their wounds <laughs> as they uh, so what happens is you go home uh, especially if it's a relatively minor surgery uh, maybe the appendix uh, you might get ho uh, go home the next day if you're otherwise quite healthy and then you're sitting at home with your wound you don't quite know is it too red is it normal red what do i do so we've um, uh, consented people uh, some people to take part in this trial where they're invited to um, uh, send us photos of their wounds. Obviously, they upload it to a secure database. They don't just kind of message them across by whatnot. So after the photos arrive at the uh, secure database, um, uh, a clinician has a look at them and uh, sends a text message to the patient that says whether the wound looks um, okay, or may, whether there are concerns and the patient should maybe go see their doctor or maybe, maybe come back to the hospital. Uh, and obviously there are systems uh, uh, where, is, there are some systems where you can some, send some text messages to patients. But why this Shiny app is so convenient is that you can send text messages to patients in a Shiny app and you can do it for a specific clinical trial. So, you know, these specific options that we've defined this is, these are specific to our trial. Uh, we don't need to hire a whole new IT company to rewrite the whole uh, hospital database uh, to enable us to try if sending these messages based on these photos is maybe useful or it maybe doesn't like really lead to better diagnosis. So together with Shiny uh, and this R package called Post and the Twilio, which is a service which you can automatically connect to from R, you can, uh, you can send text messages to patients if they've been consented to take part in a trial. 
and the the uh, the whole app you know, that connects to secure database, gets the uh, secure information, sends a secure message, updates the database, is 300 lines of R code. So what I, I, I you know, you can really, uh, someone who has done now for a few years uh, can actually do this. You don't need to hire a team of uh, IT consultants or software developers to test a simple theory of when they're looking at these, even, even looking at these photos that patients take uh, using their own smartphones at home, uh, leads to better diagnosis can be done with a shiny app. And we're just analyzing the results now, just now. So we know that it can, the study can be done, but whether the results are actually useful, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, another clinical trial that was largely enabled uh, by study uh, is, uh, is global study. Uh, we, we collected data from um, 80 countries, from 900 hospitals, uh, 400 hospitals, sorry, and 3,000 surgeons. So this data, uh, these data is really unique and precious because the data was entered by surgeons themselves. So there are, um, it's not patients entering their own data because patients might not know the exact details what happened in theater. Uh, it's not kind of hospital administrators reporting the data back to the kind of hospital board who reports them to the country statistics, public health, whatnot. No, no, this is really detailed, exactly what happened at the, in the operating theater. And then what were the outcomes of the patients? Um, did they have a wound infection or can, uh, any other uh, complications? Uh, and um, and the, the reason, again, we are using a database uh, software um, called RedCup to do it, but even so, just to manage the fact that 3,000 people need to get a login, 3,000 people around the world. So not just 3,000 people from your town or from your hospital, or you can't limit it to the internet or whatnot. Uh, 3,000 people around the world need to uh, receive secure uh, logins, but within teams of two, they need to be able to see each other's data, but they absolutely should not be, be able to see any other team's data because um, uh, we're the one who are analyzing it. So all of that, again, we managed with the Shiny app um, um, and dashboards and apps and a few more apps and a few more dashboards. Like there were so many apps and dashboards that were constantly up showing us who, how many people have registered, who have their account, who have entered data. Is the data complete? So you can see from this uh, image, the green dots are complete data. Uh, or, uh, orange is almost complete, just a few more variables. So we need to get back to them. Um, fire off an email saying, hey, could you please log in and just fill in those few things. And then red is like, something's completely off with that record. It doesn't make sense. Again, we need to contact them and ask them to uh, please uh, kind of amend it. And this shiny app that we use to administer, uh, again, this isn't the database. This is just a, a shiny app and dashboards that display what's going on in the database so we can uh, kind of manage it. Uh, but the shiny app was 1,000 lines long. So again, it is doable. Uh, it is do it's, it's doable by a single data scientist or with, with help from others, obviously, with testing and troubleshooting. Um, and now, which takes us to our first kind of practical tip. Why do I keep mentioning lines of code? Obviously, um, uh, I'm not saying that uh, lines of code is a good indicator of how complicated something is or how good something is, um, uh, because um, because of this. Let's let's call on some penguins for some examples. So, panel penguins is the new rave in the R, R trend. If you're on Twitter, following the hashtag #RStats, you'll you'll uh, you'll know about the Palmer penguins. Um, so, if we just wanted to filter for uh, penguins with the longest flippers, uh, we we would uh, I would at least write a kind of a shiny. Um, a tidyverse pipeline that send, uh, sends penguins to a filter uh, to a specific island that I'm interested in. Uh, then I'm gonna drop the missing uh, sex values because I wanna look at you know male uh, versus female. Then I'm gonna group by sex and then I'm gonna use slice wax, which is really cool. I'll, I'll pop that in a pop-up as well. Um, uh, in slice max, it gives you the maximum flipper length uh, for uh, for each sex, 
And then I'm going to use select to just present it well. So this is the resulting table there, a table that says the uh, longest uh, female flipper is 196 millimeters and 210. So that was a few lines, wasn't it? There were six lines. I could have done the same thing on a single line. Oh, well, it's broken up to two lines. So obviously lines of code is not a good indicator, but why I keep mentioning, oh, this shiny app is 300 lines of code, that is 1,000 lines of code, to give you a rough idea that a single analyst could do this, so one or two analysts could do this uh, with shiny, because uh, honestly, in most other programming languages that are not meant for data science and that are not meant for data dashboards, it would be thousands and thousands of lines of code to create like a, um, maybe a single dashboard if the language is not meant for dashboards, you know. Uh, so Shiny is really powerful. I'm going to focus on the slice uh, max again because it's my new favorite function. Uh, previously, if you look at the top example there, I would have used the uh, group by sex and then filter flipper length double equals maximum filter length. So this is a way to get like uh, the filter for the maximum value within each group um, to see what, you know, what, the, what, what your data is. But you can now replace filter flip length double equals max, which is slice max and the name of the variables. And it will give you a slice max is actually even clever enough to know whether to how to resolve ties, if there are any. Uh, you could also tell it how many you want. So I, at, in the top example, it defaults to one, but you can also say, give me the top three from each uh, subcategory. So that could be so useful. Another thing um, that I'm a big fan of is drop NA. So again, in the past, I would have done filter not equals is NA sex, but you can do the same thing with just drop NA sex as a shortcut to filter not is NA. Now, uh, so this is uh, again the hospital work, it has 900 beds. Uh, they're usually 90% full, so there are a lot of patients here, there's a lot of patient data being generated on a daily basis, and it would be good uh, to, in addition to obviously kind of doing day-to-day -day normal clinical practice, to do research on that data to see how we could make patient care, care better, if there's anything we can improve on. Um, and it's just too much data for uh, for um, uh, for data scientists. I'm obviously not the only data scientist or a data manager who works at that hospital, but even so, uh, we could really, really speed up the process uh, of uh, medical data science if we train clinicians to do some of it themselves. And that's exactly what we're doing. So uh, Surgical Informatics is a research group at Edinburgh University. It's led by a professor who's also a surgeon, who's also an R, R programmer. And um, if you look at most of those team members there, the 18 people, um, most of them are actually medical students and clinicians. So it is possible for um, uh, clinicians to do uh, our, uh, we've also we've developed a training course that is uh, aimed specifically for health data uh, research. Uh, we're uh, just now publishing it as a book. The, the book is freely available, so you can uh, uh, find it at the github.com uh, slash surgical informatics. There will be a link to the book, or you can just search for R for Health Data Science. Um, and the, the book is all about teaching R uh, to people who are not statisticians, who are not data scientists. Um, and why am I doing this? Or why are we doing this? Why are we teaching R to non-statisticians, to non-computer scientists? Well, because we really believe that you don't need to be a mechanic to drive a car. Uh, and also you don't need to be a statistician uh, to use R. Uh, that is not to say that everyone can be a statistician or do what a statistician does. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. I am saying, however, people should be capable uh, in doing some basic data cleaning, like reading in their own data sets, uh, developing a couple of um, uh, bar plots on their own. Uh, so if you if you work with p-values, um, um, previously I did a lot of R and never looked at p-values, whereas in this uh, another day goes by when someone asks me for a p-value. Uh, it's a statistical thing used a lot in medicine, but also in other fields. 
And it's insane how many kind of young researchers come and ask me, oh, this is my data set, so what's my p-value? And it turns out that they, um, they haven't even been able to count up the number of, kind of say, patients in each subgroup to realize that, oh, one of those subgroups is actually empty. There's zero patients in there because whether the data didn't get collected or maybe there was an administrative reason that data doesn't exist. So. Um, so, so for people to do, be able to do some really basic counts and plotting and exploratory data analysis on their own uh, would really uh, can help the, uh, the what statisticians can then do and really help their collaboration with statisticians to leave the most exciting complicated bits to statisticians and, and do basic exploration and counts on your own. And this is a, a lovely code by a statistician, um, Frank Harrell. If you use the HMIS package, then this is Harrell from the HMIS package. Uh, using data uh, to guide data analysis is almost as dangerous as not uh, doing so. Uh, so he, as myself, is a believer that you, you should be able to look at your data set. You should be able to know your data set and what the kind of different categories of values are there before you start stabbing at p-values. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, so people, uh, so clinicians or uh, health researchers can really help statisticians and data scientists if they, uh, if they are uh, doing data-driven research, and they could, they really should upskill, uh, and anyone can start using R and upskilling a little bit. Now. Following on from that, you know, you're, maybe you've already learned R, you can use a little bit of R, whether you're a health researcher or any other researcher in the world. Um, there's another card related uh, quote that I really like when it comes to R. You don't need good brakes uh, to go slow. Your car has good brakes so you can go fast. So if you come out, kind of think back to a really kind of weird village when the, where there's a really old person driving to the shop once a week or so, um, do you know what? Their car probably doesn't even have brakes. They just go to the shop and then the car just kind of slows down naturally and then they roll back home and the car slows down again naturally. Um, people who, if you drive slowly, you don't, maybe don't need brakes or very good brakes. So really, you want really good brakes so you can go really fast. In R, uh, the equivalent of brakes is writing tests. And I'm going to give you a really simple, yet yeah, practical example of what I mean by what's a test in R. I do not mean statistical test. I mean a programmatical uh, kind of text, test. Uh, going back to the penguins. Um, Let's say you have a data set that has three penguins in it. Um, this is the species of penguins, and these are the flipper lengths. And your um, someone comes to you, hey, data scientist, hey, data or data manager, uh, could you please uh, split this uh, data set in two? I want one to have the penguins who, uh, whose flippers are less than 900, uh, 190, and the other one I want to include uh, penguins whose flippers are uh, you know, more than that. And you create two filters. So data set one is um, data set piped into filter, flipper length is less than 190. And data set two equals data set piped into filter, flipper length is, is greater than or equals to 190. And you, you're all, you're quite a good uh, data scientist. This is now your first filter, uh, you're diligent. So You'll also check to make sure that the kind of the rows are equal. So you're like, okay, data set one has two rows, data set two has one row, that adds up to three. Uh, the original data set had three rows. Great. I think you caught everything. You send them off. Cool. Um, maybe a month later, maybe a year later, the same person comes to you. Oh, uh, I've just updated the data set. Could you split it again, please? Um, you did it uh, recently, so it shouldn't take you very long. You already have the code, right? Okay, okay. So you just uh, run the same code again. Uh, and now, but you're not quite sure because the data set has changed. So you do, you do your quick, it, um, you have a quick look at it again. Uh, instead of just sending it off at that point, you're like, okay, so this is a one, and two, this is a two. Wait, wait, but it had four. Okay, one is missing, one is missing. So by the time you looked at both of them and you figured out, at least you discovered the mistake, right? 
Uh, so obviously the mistake was that um, there's a missing value and neither of those filters would capture the missing values. Now, this might be what the person is wanting. Maybe they want missing values to be dropped, but that wasn't explicit and that wasn't said in the instructions. So you either need to clarify, or in this case, I've, I've co contacted the co um, colleague again and they've said, oh yeah, those with missing values should be grouped under the smaller group. So let's change the first data set into flipper length is less than 190 or is NA. So just, just to make sure that the, the, the uh, number of, well, patients, number of penguins in the two data sets add up to the total number uh, of penguins in the original data set, because that could cause a lot of confusion. Um, so while you've done this, you know, you've had to check the two data sets again, you've had to add the values to get together to, you know, oh, it doesn't add up. Really? What you, you could have gone faster with the test. So if the first time you did the split, if you add it in this line into your R code, stop if not, uh, n row data set plus n row um, data set two, one and two, uh, double equals n row, you know, the original data set. Um, uh, the first time it would have just run through it, uh, would have just said true, or it actually wouldn't have said anything, it would just have worked. But the second time, that means you could have just rerun the script without going through and checking the data sets one by one because you would have triggered your own created error and like, oh, wow, you're crazy. Why would you create a new error? But that means the error would take you right to the place where, you know, where, where there was a mismatch. And obviously most examples are not that simple. It's not a simple split of split this data frame into two. You would usually have a few filters. You're, you know, you're applying some cleaning, maybe you're joining with another data set. So if you add in stop, if not, that would automatically just kind of run through if all the values add up, but error at the right place at the right time, you can go faster on because you have good breaks because you have a good um, test. Um, so stop if now is built into base star. It's a really basic thing. You just kind of put some the things you would normally put in a filter. You put in there and it will scream if it's not true. However, there's also a package called test that that has a lot more functions uh, where you can test the equivalence of a few things. You wanna make sure uh, things look the way you expect them to look, things look similar to the way they looked the last time or uh, kind of different, or they don't look similar to the way they looked last time. So the library test that uh, has kind of a lot more functions and and that, but you can actually get a lot done with just stop if not, and they're really easy to add. It's that just that single line goes into your script and it, um, and it will help you stop if you are about to make a mistake. So to conclude, uh, why I love using our health data science, because um, uh, there's so much data, uh, and R is just so great at uh, not only dealing with data, but R is user friendly. The, um, the community is so great that pretty much anyone can learn R if they want to. You don't need um, a degree uh, or many years of education. Uh, you, can, you can start learning with the help of others online. You can uh, join Slacks. You can uh, go. Um, uh, you can learn to use R. There are so many free books on bookdown.org, including mine. Um, and, but remember, to go fast, you need to be able to break and test, uh, testing your code uh, using top if not, or test that functions really helps you break. Uh, so you can quite confidently run through your script because it will break for you. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much uh, for, for this talk. <laughs> I think it was a very, very nice uh, combination of, uh, of uh, giving uh, some general, general uh, ideas and some very specific tips uh, of uh, our coach. So I hope everyone found something. Um, so does anyone have any questions at this moment? Um, there was uh, one one person, Silvia, who said uh, that they loved the mechanic statistician analogy, uh, and that was really cool, I think, as well. 
Um, but so if, if nobody, nobody has a question at the moment, I was just wondering uh, about this global survey that seemed very interesting. Maybe you can just uh, talk a little bit more about it. Like what was it exactly or how did the surgeons uh, enter the data? Mm -hmm. Was it into an app actually that you built? And also mm -hmm. what kind of data then they built and did they have any problems with that or, or they were just, it worked perfectly well. <laughs> um, yeah. Of course, they had problems. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of problems? <laughs> uh, so data entry uh, was managed by a software called RedCap, which is uh, developed by Vanderbilt University, but it is freely available. Obviously, you need to kind of install it and manage it on a secure database and manage all the logins, but the software, um, so, so I wouldn't reinvent the, uh, the wheel. However, how to manage who around the world gets access to that software and who's teamed up with who, uh, who lives in which hospital, who lives in hospital, uh, which country, uh, it's not that obvious because uh, you would think that each surgeon works in a single hospital, but no, no, they move and they work in multiple hospitals. So it's quite a lot of management to figure out, um, you know, which hospital and which pay, uh, kind of patients were entered. So RedCap is the um, database software we use. And it's, again, it's very general purpose. It's used uh, in a lot of like psychology and kind of social studies as well, although it was originally built for kind of medical and clinical trials. Uh, and then we used R uh, to manage all of the administration, to manage uh, who we should give accounts to, who's entered what, who we should email to. Um, and we've done it three times now. We've just started the fourth time. So we do it in waves. Uh, so we usually give uh, surgeons around the world uh, a half a year period, and, but then we ask them to enter all patients who get operated on uh, within sometimes two weeks, sometimes four weeks, depending on the study question. And so for two or four weeks, uh, within any time of those six months, uh, they uh, enter anonymized. Obviously, there are no names or anything like that, uh, no birth, dates of birth, but still like, you know, this is... Um, a man who's this old, uh, he has diabetes, he doesn't have HIV, and he had this surgery, this, this way, this incisions, this medications, and these were their outcomes. Uh, so we've done it, like I said, the fourth time, fourth kind of wave of projects started, um, where, they, where we collect this data from as many countries as we are, as many surgeons as we can, and then we analyze it all in a kind of global uh, joint effort we don't do kind of discrimination against this country is better than the other because that doesn't matter it's all about the science it's all about getting this much information together so we can make uh, you know, a big um, a very kind of solid conclusions yeah of course so now it's it seems very exciting um I, I would just have one more question about the same thing so was there also some kind of um selection of the hospitals or or that was also done by the same red cap uh, that you mentioned like uh, how how it was decided which hospitals or which surgeons from which hospitals would participate it was called a convenience sample <laughs> or even <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, anyone around the world could uh, could sign up to take part. Uh, okay. They would have to make sure that they apply for all the local ethical and information governance approvals. Because, um, you know, as a surgeon or a doctor, you're not just allowed to start entering patient data into a random uh, database uh, around the world. No, 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 you need permission. So everyone uh, who took part in uh, the study got local approvals. Uh, or kind of ethics, uh, ethics approvals in their country. It's not enough that we had uh, approvals in the UK. Each country, you would need to get your, you know, your country to approve it. Uh, but then once they had the approvals, uh, they could just uh, register. They would fill in the registration form, and then we would use um, uh, various uh, R. Because if you, um, uh, there's a tab here that says all registrations, so we would use that to monitor registrations and check that they're all, uh, you know, kind of complete enough. We are. Uh, we're checking that they're unique, so the same person doesn't accidentally register twice and end up with two accounts. So we used R to um, kind of monitor and clean all of the registrations, but they uh, registered by filling in the form. Really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, we have now a couple of questions. So one was uh, also from Sylvia about uh, Shiny. Um, so 
Uh, she's new to Shiny, but she understands that it's easy to spend a lot of time creating and customizing a dashboard. How do you like to assess what kind of projects are worth the time and effort? Um, yeah, I, 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 I go down that rabbit hole. I sometimes spend half a day making a dashboard and then like two days changing colors on it and axis labels. <laughs> And so I, it helps when you have deadlines. <laughs> so you have to send it off and you can't spend too much time fidgeting with colors and stuff like that. It can be a lot of fun though. Um, and you're right, I know exactly what you mean. In the past, I've definitely created shiny apps that no one used because actually they weren't the highest priority and they maybe weren't, uh, weren't worth the effort. Um, uh, so these days I try to... I try to, if you ask people, would you like me to build a Shiny app? They will always say yes. Uh, so it's quite hard to um, figure out if they would then actually use the Shiny app quite actively. You know, if I spend two days with making an app and then they only look at it for three minutes, then probably I would have, could have given them the same information in three minutes, you know, straight from the kind of script rather than putting it into a dashboard or an app. So it's just up to you to figure out how often people would be using it. Do they need to get an updated data every day or every week? Or do they need to a single number once? Uh, do they need a single number every day? Um, so yeah, try to, try to really, really figure out how it gets used and don't get it. <laughs> but it's fun. It's a lot of fun <laughs> to make them. <laughs> I bet. So, so here's also Andy who says that it's, um, it's, uh, it's a good way, Shiny then is a good way to allow people to develop uh, super useful tools without having to be or pay a large software development team. So, so I guess that's one of the main advantages of, uh, of using a Shiny or building a Shiny app. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Just sending like text messages um, and, and stuff like that. Like, it's pretty cool that you can do that from our, and obviously you can also send emails that's like pretty basic compared with text messages <laughs> yeah that's quite a very broad um you know broad thing <laughs> what to do uh okay and then nutsa is asking uh, about writing tests um are there any rule of thumbs uh, or the most common set of tests one must put in place every time while manipulating data? Oh, good one, good one. Well, it's really data set specific because uh, I, I keep saying patient at a level, uh, you know, every role is a patient or in my examples, every role is a penguin. Uh, but maybe you're not looking, uh, maybe you're not working with uh, kind of individual data. Maybe you're looking at uh, averages across countries or averages um, but yeah I tend to add a lot of tests that make sure that after my filters I still have ret retained all the information and it's not always as obvious as a uh, number of rows sometimes you have to check that the number of unique um, values so let's say you had 10 countries in your data set but you had lots of different information about 10 countries so I would do uh, n distinct um and then check that the end is sums of n distinct so it still add up to 10 so you still get the same kind of number of uh, list of values um, but anything other than that checking for number of rows and checking for distinct values i think is uh, kind of specific your your data set um, obviously if you're adding things up you could add make sure that they don't add up to more than a a million if uh, if the world population is seven billion and you've uh, suddenly written a script uh, that one day looks fine uh, it's worth adding that the next day can't accidentally summarize into you know 70 billion maybe you just ran the same script you know 10 times or you know kind of duplicated the number same 10 times so it just really depends on your data how do I get surgeons to look at your results test? But oh, they, all, they don't always. <laughs> uh, so a lot of the dashboards I actually write for myself. So uh, it's easier for me to chase them down and say, hey, hey, you need to enter your data points. If I know exactly like what they haven't done. Um, but all of the surgeons I work with are uh, academic surgeons. So they wanna do research. 
the um, they're, they're not forced to take part in these uh, this study. Like uh, uh, Lily asked, how do you choose the people who take part? Uh, they self register and they want to take part in here. Uh, so um, they want to make sure that uh, they're not just uh, operating on patients, but uh, they, they year on ten years from now uh, they're doing like um, kind of the best they can be doing and that there's progress. Um, but at the same time, you need to keep them as simple as possible. Um, just, you know, get to the point. Uh, don't include too much text, or too much information. And that's true, not just for surgeons, but for anyone. Because when you're building dashboards, it's quite easy to get carried away and put like 10 plots on it. And you're like, oh, these are so cool. They're all different. That's so funny. And then you send it to another person. They're like, what is this? this is, I don't have time for this. And then they don't even look at a single one because there are too many. So if you want them to look at one plot, send them one plot, not 10. Some very good um, comments here, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking from experience. Yeah. I've tried to tell but it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's very valuable. Okay, so um, are there any more questions or comments? Um, doesn't seem so. So uh, I think it's uh, it's very informative that you told us today uh, and uh, we will definitely have a look at your book as well. Uh, I, I already had some glimpses at it so I would recommend it uh, to others as well and not only um, even if you're not into health uh, health specifically it has some very general uh, tips um, that is useful for anyone really. Um, but, uh, but yeah so the slides uh, are also included and um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for coming and for agreeing to talk <laughs> about your uh, experiences. You know, it's, uh, it's very nice to hear about um, different people from, from different backgrounds and what they do exactly with our. Uh, so good luck with everything. Um, and yeah, I guess if anybody has any questions, they can also turn to you directly. Yeah, I am on the Our Lady Slack, if you can find me there. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a very good uh, source <laughs> and contact po uh, point. Um, but uh, okay, so uh, thank you. And 